guys. Hello, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us for the first of three speaker series programs for the LGBT Elder Initiative's 10-year anniversary speaker series. My name is Dr. John Lee Antonio, and I work as a geriatrician and palliative care physician at Jefferson in Center City, and have been a board member for the LGBT Elder Initiative for the past three years or so. I'm so excited that in 2020, we are celebrating 10 years of the LGBT Elder Initiative, and we couldn't be more excited to bring you programming leading up to our annual gala, a Cause for Applause, which serves to celebrate and help support the work of the Elder Initiative. Um, um, prior to getting started today, I'd like to thank our two wonderful sponsors for today's program. First, we have PA Health and Wellness, who is our diamond sponsor, and the Philly AIDS Thrift, who is our platinum sponsor. Um, both of these organizations have been great supporters of our work, and specifically for the entire speaker series, as well as our 10-year anniversary celebration. Um, in 2020, COVID has been the focus of so much conversation in the healthcare world, and we know that um, certain populations are disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. Today, our conversation will hopefully highlight some of the challenges facing our communities and to talk about what are um, what what, what several organizations across the region are working on to help fight these disparities. Um, lastly, I'm gonna be making sure that we have time for our panelists to answer your questions directly. And um, for that, we're gonna be using the Q&A feature here on Zoom, as well as um, for those streaming on Facebook Live, questions could be entered in there as well. So for today's panel, I have the honor of introducing three individuals leading this hard work kind of talking about COVID healthcare disparities here in Philadelphia. Uh, I guess we could go one by one and we could start with Dr. Tracy Trice. How are Hi, you? Good I'm doing well, thank you. Um, thanks for having me and for inviting me to participate today. Um, as you mentioned, uh, my name is Dr. Tri Tracy Trice. I uh, am a family physician at uh, Thomas Jefferson University, specifically Sydney Kimmel Medical College. Um, I am a practicing physician, but I'm also um, the assistant dean for diversity and student diversity programs in, in the medical college. Um, and just really excited to discuss, uh, really um, have, a, have a critical discussion about um, the, the effect that COVID um, has, has had on um, marginalized and vulnerable, historically vulnerable uh, communities. So glad to be here. Thank you so much for being here. Um, Anna, how about you? Thanks, John. Uh, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Anna Keith, Vice President of Long-Term Supports and Services for PA Health and Wellness. We are one of three community health choices managed care organizations in the Commonwealth. Um, and I work within our organization. I lead our diversity and inclusion um, work teams uh, for the health plan that uh, work into our, our uh, parent company, Centene. Um, and I'm just happy to be here today to talk about what we've done to address these issues with um, those participants that we support with COVID-19 uh, concerns, and they might be listening today. Thank you so much. And last but not least, Dr. Nancy Brisbane. Hi, I'm Nancy Brisbane. I use she, her, and her, her pronouns. I am the Chief Medical Officer at Mazzoni Center and part of the interim leadership team. And glad to be here. Appreciate the invitation. Thank you so much. So I think a good place to get started is how has COVID impacted where you're working and the, and the clients and patients who you work with? Let's start with Anna. Okay. Um, well, obviously, I think probably all of us have felt it at work and at home um, pretty significantly. From a health plan standpoint, oh, we went home on March 20th, um, where we moved all of our operations into uh, different units so that we didn't have a single individual have a single gap in um, their calling our health plan or any escalations that they might have. In partnership with the Office of Long-Term Living, PA Health and Wellness has uh, worked closely with the department to monitor and ensure that individuals' needs are being met. Um, we, we saw an impact in the community um, around individuals needing additional supports um, 
and initially the fear of whether or not an in individual might be infected with um, so additional supports were requested PPE was top of the priority list for PA health and wellness um, and I can share more of that in a little bit but uh, ensuring that people had the protective equipment that they needed in order to be as safe as they could and that their workers had uh, protective equipment. We saw a change in how workers wanted to work. Uh, a lot of families uh, stepped up and wanted to be there with their family members because these individuals were also at home. Um, now, that, now that workers are going back to the workplace, the area that we've seen it probably the most is around adult day centers and how that's impacting individuals that used to get their services there um, and the meals there. And we've had to uh, supplement that in other ways. So uh, I'll hand it off to my fellow panelists from there and we can talk about that more here in a little bit. Dr. Trice, how about you? Yeah, so, um... I think it's affected me. I mean, at Jefferson, we, we, we are not only um, a clinical enterprise seeing patients, but we are also responsible for, you know, educating our many learners, our, our students, um, you know, residents, fellows. Um, and so it, it definitely impacted the academic environment, um, uh, you know, but, but, but speaking to, to the clinical environment and, and um, you know, our, our patients, all of our patients, uh, it was definitely, um, something that was was a challenge um, back in you know the late winter early spring when everything first hit um, you know we the, the organization was trying to make decisions about um, whether or not to stay open offices were making decision about whether or not to close but also but trying to to balance the the, the very clear and acknowledge the very clear impact that that closing would have um, on, on access to our already vulnerable um, urban underserved po populations. Um, and so, you know, many of the patients that, 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 I, uh, that I was seeing at the time uh, are, you know, of low socioeconomic status, um, but also are a large minority uh, a patient, po large minority patient population, excuse me. Uh, and so with that comes a lot of what we hear about in the news in terms of who is being affected most, those who have chronic health conditions, um, those who are frontline workers. Um, I can't tell you how many of my patients actually worked in the prison system and were, were coming in scared to go to work. Um, and so there, there's the health impact, but then there's also the economic, the economic impact that many of our patients were, 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 were faced with. Um, so it's, it's, I mean, it's definitely been a real challenge and, and now we're where we are today and, you know, we open back up uh, as, you know, the, the, the state guidelines um, after being shut down, now we're opening, opened back up, but it seems like we're going backwards. Um, and so, you know, there's, I, I think is yet, it remains to be seen how much of an impact um, that COVID um, will have on, 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 on our communities. So it's been a challenge. It's a lot of stuff, right? It's been a crazy, it's been a crazy few months. <laughs> Dr. Brisbane, how are things over, over, over at your, at your uh, clinic? So we certainly um, had to make that shift as well from in-person care to telemedicine. So the vast majority of what we do now is telemedicine. We learned it all very, very quickly. I really hadn't been delivering any uh, care in that way before. Um, we've been working really hard to maintain that balance, as you all have talked about already, between the safety of our staff and our patients. Sort of if your staff is ill, that impacts their families and their personal communities, but then also impacts our ability to deliver care. So really um, working really hard to make sure that we're able to protect everyone, um, changing policies, starting working from home in ways that we hadn't done before. Uh, and that covered both our health center, but also the care management services that we provide. Our behavioral health exists entirely by telemedicine, even now. 
Um, our food bank program shifted from being a sort of come in shop, pick up your food to prepackaged bags. So folks had less contact, but we're still able to maintain that support. Um, and then just sort of addressing in telemedicine, the ways to maintain all the kinds of care and whether or not that needed to be in person or by telemedicine and figuring out that distinction for primary care, for HIV care, for gender affirming services. And then of course, for people who were sick with COVID and how to take care of them as well. Uh, and a lot of changes that we just talk about in terms of messaging to patients. So especially now we we're just talking about this this morning, you know, if you're being told that you can go get your hair cut, why can't you go to the doctor and understanding the difference between the type of environments that those are and the risks that they pose and the risk that they pose both to that person and to the environment in which they're entering. Wow. Have you guys seen like a higher amount of people being afraid to come into the office or do you feel like patients are more eager to come be seen in person? We started out with, I think, a number of people really not being interested at all in coming in. So we had providers available who um, didn't necessarily have anyone to see. And then there reached a point where folks were like, all right, well, enough of this. And I want to try to get back to some normalcy. And I want to sit in the same room with you and have that conversation. I had a patient tell me, I'm not talking to you on the telephone anymore. I'm coming in. I was like, okay, <laughs> you know, that's fine. Um, so yeah, I think there's that shift to sort of people's tolerance for this new method and, and also the, the, the loss of, of what happens when you're in a room with someone and it's, it's not all about just listening to someone's heart and lungs. Yeah, I think, you know, people, there, there's something to be said about the, the interpersonal interaction that you can have that you, you know, that gets lost in, in telemedicine. I think like, like the patients like physicians were even appreh were apprehensive. I mean, I know I was apprehensive. I, I wanna, I want to be in the room. I want to see you. I want to be able to, to examine you um, as well. So it was even a difficult transition for, for me. Um, but I think people got used to it over time. But even with more time, as Dr. Brisbane was, was, was mentioning, I think people are, are like, okay, enough is enough. Um, so, and I also think it was a generational thing too. Um, you know, many of our younger patients were fine with it. And many of our older patients were either just didn't want to do it because they didn't want to do it or didn't want to do it because they didn't have access to or, or the know-how to, to access, um, you know, the telemedicine portals. Um, so, so I think that played, played a role as well. Something that was kind of shocking for me through this whole thing was realizing the number of people who don't have internet access. Mm -hmm. And that to me was alarming when I realized it's something like 25% of people, I think was the statistic I heard, <laughs> which is such an, it's a wild number when you think about how everything is happening online today. Yeah. Are and, you, and we take advantage, like we think everyone has a smartphone. Like I was seeing patients right. the other day that I was like, you don't have a smartphone, but I'm like, why am I even, why, why am I asking this? So, right. Right. <laughs> um, so yeah. Yeah. Um, and thinking back prior to the pandemic, Dr. Trice, the, the, it's a, it's a um, specific question for you. What were some of the health disparities most concerning to professionals in the healthcare field? What were kinds of things people were seeing? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, oftentimes when we're talking about health disparities, we're talking about them along class lines and we're talking about them along racial and, and ethnic lines. Um, and I think some of the, 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 the most concerning or the, the top, the leading causes of morbidity and mortality for us as a country um, in, include things that deeply um, impact um, vulnerable populations. So we're talking about obesity, we're talking about diabetes, we're talking about heart disease, we're talking about cancer across all forms of cancer. Um, we're talking about mental health. Um, you know, the, these are these are things where, you know, we've been talking about these health disparities for over a hundred years, well over a hundred years. Um, but these are things that also, you know, as it relates to 
to COVID will, will increase one's risk for COVID related complications. Um, and so if you're already be, if you belong to or identify with a population that is, you know, has a higher prevalence of, of these chronic health conditions, there's just, you know, it just compounds things. Um, so, you know, th th those, you know, those are the, were the leading, the leading causes and continue to be um, a challenge. I think what happened, you know, one of the things that happened with, with, with COVID is not only that those, those things compounded COVID, but there was also this incidental consequence of people, you know, being so fearful to access care or go to the hospital, don't go, you know, not wanting to go to the emergency room for, for risk of, you know, being exposed, but, you know, if your diabetes is out of control or you're having chest pain or you need to, to act, you know, seek immediate medical attention, people were scared to do so. And so there was some of these um, incident, incidental or un unintended consequences that, that, that also uh, we saw surface with, with, with COVID. So. Yeah, it's it, it, it's it's a it's a it's kind of a phenomenon. I, I think we're seeing in the hospital patients who have cancer, which was kind of untreated with with like chemotherapy regimens they were supposed to have, or screening that wasn't done, and then finding out that a certain illness has kind of gone further than it, it right. probably would have. Absolutely. Um, in thinking about the LGBT community, Dr. Brisbane, are there any specific disparities you could think of? That have that have, have kind of been highlighted by COVID. I think there's a number of things that are known um, specifically for LGBTQ elders that have been shown to sort of weigh more heavily. So there's a lifelong experience of discrimination that spreads into so many things. So someone's willingness to access care. Have you do you have and have you found a LGBTQ competent? provider with whom you can discuss all of the things that you should be able to talk about with your primary care provider? Um, do you have a social network that's able to hold you up during a time that's difficult as it relates to a chronic illness or an acute illness such as COVID? Um, do you have a, a safe and healthy place to live, access to food, all those sorts of things that have all directly come from having a life in which you've been treated with disrespect um, and not been able to access as well. So maybe you're maybe you weren't able to pursue the kind of career that you might have otherwise pursued. So that impacts your financial status now. That impacts your pension. That impacts where you're able to live now. Just that whole stream that comes from having been discriminated against your whole life um, then comes to fore with all these other things. So now you lay on top of maybe you're food insecure because you haven't, you don't have a really solid financial stance and then you get COVID on top of it. So it, it just creates, it's compounding things. And then as, as Dr. Trice said, you add in things like the, the increased um, impact of folks with, who have folks of color and COVID. And so, so you know, imagine if you're a, a, a trans woman of color who's 75 years old, you know, now we have all of these things all, all laid in. Um, data shows that chosen families, quote, chosen families are more likely, maybe folks don't have children or don't have a social network that's multi-generational in the way that uh, heterosexual folks might have. So if, you're, if your cohort is the same age, then they are experiencing the same things. And of course, as you well know, you know, one 75 year old person is not the same as the next 75 year old person, but there are going to be some similarities and some challenges that they each face that they may or may not be able to help each other um, in that support and managing through uh, a chronic illness or an acute illness. And then, the, and then the sort of dovetailed on that is this isolation that lots of seniors experience increased isolation. And then again, you add in that discriminatory environment. Um, and then again, if there's, you're isolated, you're told now that you can't go out because that's a dangerous thing to do. Um, you don't necessarily have the, the network to bring you food or to help you with your medications, to call, just call on you um, as you're not feeling well. Uh, so I think that all of those things just sort of layer in and they 
have been shown to, some of those things have been shown to be more issues in, for folks who are elder and LGBTQ. Yeah, I, I, I wanted to add to that. I mean, we talk about access to care and, and that could come in the form of lack of, lack, just lack of health care, right? Or, or, or health um, coverage gaps. Um, or it could come in in the form of, you know, fear of access in the care, as as, as Dr. Brisbane mentioned, um, because of, uh, you know, ex past experiences with, with discrimination. Um, but then there's also on the other end of it is, you know, non inclusive, you know, paid leave, like, you know, if, if you have a if you have a family member or a significant other or, you know, whatever happened that, you know, that that ends up getting sick for any reason, whether it's COVID or, or otherwise, and then you need to, to, to take time off like those that it, it's not equal um, mm -hmm. across across the board. And so I think, you know, with the LGBT community sort of is, um, you know, does not have the same access to to paid leave um, as you know, unfortunately, as as their non LGBTQ kind of counterparts. It's such a perfect transition to kind of services. Anna, how have you seen kind of um, services impacted during the pandemic, and how have you guys kind of pivoted to kind of kind of of um, support the community? Well, okay. Let me make sure you can hear me. Okay. Um, well, early on when I, I would say that PA Health and Wellness was very proactive in this effort. Um, we saw what was on the horizon as things began to happen across the, in other countries. We began having uh, team meetings about it. We organized a COVID-19 um, war room, as we called it, and it brought in the leadership met every day to track the numbers and uh, they still continue to meet, granted not as frequently as they were doing, like the war room was serious war room all the time. Um, but um, PA Health and Wellness initiated uh, wellness calls across every single member that we had for several weeks calling, um, calling them every week to check on them um, it got to the place where a number of members were saying, please quit calling me because I don't need you to call me every week. Um, but what we did find was there that there were some, like Dr. Brisbane had indicated, there were some that were lonely and scared. And those wellness calls were a lifeline outside the doors of their home. And, and so we continued those. And for individuals who have uh, nurse care managers, or if they had a social worker that was their service coordinator, for anyone that was deemed and still is deemed at risk based on their health risk scores, uh, or any type of medical condition that they have that that might precipitate more concern, those wellness calls continue with their service coordinator. Uh, granted, now at this point, we've asked the individual, how often do you want us to reach out to you? And many of them are, are saying, once a month is fine. Uh, I don't know that we have anyone we're reaching out to weekly unless they have an acute condition that they've just come home from a hospital from. Uh, PA Health and Wellness did. Uh, we've had about 2,400 positive COVID cases that have um, um, happened with, um, that we've confirmed rather for individuals that we support uh, that have reported in with having COVID. Um, those, those individuals are monitored and we, you know, we have nurses that are reaching out to them and we work with their PCP. Um, so from that standpoint, I think from a health standpoint, the physical health piece is well under control. What we're trying to monitor are the social determinants of health piece that, that align with it. Does the person have enough food? Is the person in safe housing? Do they have supports they need in their housing? Do they have access to transportation so they can get to the doctor? Do they feel safe doing that? Do they have family members living in the home that may be COVID positive or, um, or at risk that we need to assist in ensuring that they have PPE um, available to them? 
for individuals that we support who, who practice uh, more of the self-determination model where they hire their own staff, um, those individuals don't have the luxury of an agency that provides PPE, which a lot of the agencies have done that. So PA Health and Wellness has ensured that, that individuals who are in self-determination have PPE. Um, we've worked with uh, SEIU to get that into the hands of participants uh, so that they, they have that protection. Um, and then um, probably the most impacted that we have noticed is our adult day centers. They've closed. Um, some have opened recently with limited participation, but participants are going home and some participants are still too scared to use the adult day centers that they used to use um, to go in and get socialization and meals. We have brought in care into their home in order to um, offset what the adult day was providing uh, and that has helped. But now what we're also seeing since some have opened, some of these seniors, and I don't blame them, but they don't want to leave their home now. They're still scared. I, it's, I would be too. I would be too. I mean, and they're very vulnerable. So we're just taking each person, one person at a time, looking at what the situation is, addressing the situation with the people around them that care about them or their service coordinator if they're more uh, isolated and then getting them what they need um, and looking at community resources as well, not just Medicaid funded services, because keep in mind the individuals that PA Health and Wellness serve are um, Medicaid or duals who are some of our poorest individuals in the Commonwealth and um, we have to help them with lots of resources. So we're always looking for resources. Specifically for folks utilizing those kind of day programs, it must be such a challenge for those families because you imagine you have the family member who lives with them, who has to go to work potentially, who now has their loved one at home and they're like, well, what the hell do I do now? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's scary. So in those cases, we bring uh, the service coordinator will bring the team together, look at what the needs are for that family member, especially someone who might have a dementia or Alzheimer's and the family's been home, now they're going back to work. Um, we need to make sure that person is safe at home and has what they need to, to uh, maintain that independence. Incredible work you guys are doing. It's, it's awesome. Do you have... Um quite a few questions from the panelists. One of the things that um, Keith just put into the chat was, could we define health risk scores? Oh yeah, I apologize for that, Keith. That's oh. a, a health plan term. So whenever we do assessments of individuals, the physical health assessments, a health risk screening, um, our system will identify a score. So yes, I have diabetes. Yes, I have a health condition, a heart condition. Yes. Um, I have trouble breathing. Um, uh, yes, I've had a hospitalization in the last six months. Uh, those all have a metric with them and it will drive a score. And that score says this person is likely more at risk than I would be if I put no, 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 I haven't had any of those things. Um, and so that person granted logically would likely need a little more concern because their physical health condition warrants it. Awesome. Steve also asked the question, like many, I was out on the, on the street during election week at demonstrations. We were masking outside and I'm following the city's guidance to stay home for 14 days and get a test after seven days. Could you speak to us in that situation? Anybody on the panel want to take that one? I mean, yeah, I, I, I think that, you know, when you're in an environment where there's a large number of people um, and it becomes d difficult to physically distance, um, physically distance, uh, you know, it, 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 it sort of, it's some, in some ways increases your risk of potential exposure to, so to be on the safe side and to, 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 to do the right, you know, do the right thing, do your due diligence for yourself, those around you, family, coworkers, et cetera, um, you know, the guidelines, 
um, as per the CDC are to, 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 to sort of self-isolate for those 14 days um, and, and, and to get tested. The thing is, is that with, you know, with, with COVID, um, you know, sometimes a, a, a negative test. So you, you're getting, they, you're advised to get tested in, in seven days, but to stay home and to self-isolate for 14 days. So that's an additional seven days. Let's say your test after seven days is, is, is negative. You don't want to take false. Uh, um, uh, sometimes you can have false. You can have false <laughs> negative. Essentially, there's a high rate of false negativity. And so, just because your test is negative doesn't mean that you don't necessarily have COVID. Now, if you if it's negative and you're asymptomatic, it's probably likely that you know less likely that you do. However, it's still uh, there's still a small percentage of, of of the chance that you could still have it. Um, and so, allowing that cushion, that extra cushion of an extra seven days just you know allows for less of, of a chance um, of potential transmission so you can allow yourself and your body to to recover and you know decrease um, the, vi the viral load that you could potentially have so um, Dr. Brisbane I don't know if you want to add to it agree completely <laughs> um, you know, it, you know need to exercise that voice yeah. yeah need to exercise that voice and you know do the things that are um, important, but always is, uh, live with it cautiously. You know, don't go out, don't do things that you really don't need to do to increase that chance that you could be exposed to someone um, who may not be taking the same kinds of precautions that you are. You just have no idea what other people are doing. And, um, you know, it's a very serious disease. Granted, the vast majority are mild. Um, but we, there's still so much about it that we don't know, sort of long-term complications, how it affects different age groups differently. You know, can you get it again? When is the vaccine really coming? There's just, there's so much that if you can avoid it, it's, it's best to do so. So speaking of vaccines, which I know is a, a hot topic right now, and this is one of the questions that we received previously. I know we have a couple more questions in the chat. We're going to get to them, but this was a, this is, it's kind of a hot topic right now. We, um, in the past week, Pfizer and Moderna have both released some kind of preliminary data on their vaccines, which is really reassuring, really positive. One of the concerns from our audience, which I think this question just highlights how scared people are, is what, what, what actual measures are going to be taken to ensure that community members have equal access to this vaccine? such a, a scary question that people feel like they have to ask that. Isn't that something? I'm just like hit by that a little bit right now. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I don't know the answer to that question. I, that is something that I, I stay up thinking about. <laughs> um, you know, there's so much newness with all of this for, for one, you know, uh, while I think this is, um, Exciting in some ways, it's clearly um, due to the, the genius of American medicine and, and American, you know, biomedical science that we were able to um, develop a vaccine in such a short period of time that this has never been done before. Um, so there is, um, there, there is some, there's, you know, we, we can be excited about that, but we can also be cautious about it at, at, at the same time. Um, and, you know, for that matter, what's the cost going to be? Is it going to be accessible? Is it going to be covered under all insurance plans? I mean, all of the you know, pri private, private insurance versus those who are on, you know, um, state sanctioned insurance like Medicaid, Medicare. Uh, I, I don't, we, 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 we don't know yet. I mean, at, at least in the, in the readings that I have, um, that I have read and what I've been watching and listening to, I don't think we we know that yet. I think they I think they are saying that, um, but I don't I don't know. We we don't know for sure yet. So, it's such a complicated issue too because I feel like these things are so impacted by politics, by the stock market, by all these different things. And so somebody says, "Hey, I have a vaccine," and now their stock goes through the roof. And right. so it's you know. I take everything very cautiously in 2020, very, very kind of skeptical, but I'm, I'm hopeful, but I'm definitely skeptical. Right. 
Um, in terms well, of- I, could, I yeah, just want to yeah. add that I know the city is preparing a plan to try to make, you know, to implement some kind of distribution that would be um, more readily available to a number of different organizations. Um, but as you say, some of the characteristics of the vaccine will, at least the Pfizer one with the, the deep freeze that's required, right. um, really tells us where it's going to be and who's going to be able to administer it because that's not a freezer your, your corner doc has that they're going to be able to give out that vaccine. So, um, you know, I think there are many people are working on it and it will depend on a lot. The logistics will depend on a lot of things, how it needs to be stored, how many shots there are, when does it become um, effective? So what's kind of the lead time? Do we have the, the people power to get it done? Will folks be accepting of taking it Exactly. Anyway, um, certainly there's a lot of hesitation about, about new medications and new vaccines. There's a lot of well-earned distrust of the healthcare system. So there's, there's just so many factors. Plus for the uh, Pfizer one, you need two shots, which is, mm -hmm. it's hard to get people to do that for things like HPV or other, other types of things where you need to have an extra shot. So it's really um, a lot to be, to be seen on that. Um, in thinking about telehealth, I think one of the, you know, one of the, the things that I've been realizing, which we talked about a little bit earlier, was about how lots of folks don't have access to the technology. Anna, have you seen anything through PA Health and Wellness where you've been able to get technology to folks in the community? Is that something you guys have worked with at all? We have for the nursing homes. Okay. Um, so that we could bridge um, residents with their families and provided iPads in nursing homes um, so that individuals did have that contact. Um, we also have been working closely with having uh, better access to the electronic health records with nursing homes so we could do our um, outreach from service coordination um, to those individuals. A lot of individuals in nursing homes have conveyed the desire to move home and get get back into the community. And um, so what, what we've been trying to do is coordinate those services with their healthcare staff in the nursing facilities. From a community standpoint, we did survey our uh, participants and found exactly what you're saying. Very few of our seniors um, have access to technology have internet in their home um, or, and if they do have some access they're going to need someone to come help them set up a zoom call or some of those types of technologies that are available it's not as simply uh, simple as pushing a button so um, we put our energy uh, for technology into the nursing facilities where they'd have those supports to get um, access outside yeah that makes a lot of sense. Have you guys seen any kind of resources in the community to help get seniors access to telehealth? Is this something you guys have seen in your practices, Nancy and Tracy? I don't know if you guys have. Well, um, I mean, I don't know. I, I don't know the, spe the specifics of sort of on, on an individual level for, for, um, for, for my patients. Um, you know, mo most of them, I would say, the overwhelming majority do, like do have some form of access, whether it's not having a smartphone or, you know, a, an iPad or a computer, a computer, one of those devices. But there are there is a significant number that that don't. I know that. Um, I think it's a matter of communication because I think there are are resources available to those who who don't. Um, I know Comcast. I don't know if they're still doing this, but Comcast was offering, and this is not, I have no disclosures. I'm not getting paid by Comcast. If you um, are, but I, know, like <laughs> I mean, I know at one point they were offering free internet um, <laughs> for you know those who are, are low income. Um, and so I wonder if they would, you know, perhaps do the same thing for those maybe who are um of a certain age uh, that so, so that they can, you know, 
we can chip away at the barriers that, or at least eliminate that being a barrier to, to someone's ability to access, um, access care. So. We did a couple of things. Uh, one mm -hmm. is that for folks who don't have uh, access of their own, but if they come to the office, we have tablets set up so that they're able to have a telemedicine visit on site through in a separate space so that they're, um, <clears throat> should they need lab work as an example, they can still get that, but they can have that provider visit and it's it sort of keep, keeps that risk down for everyone. And those are tablets that we have as an organization. The other thing um, is that we had a, uh, cell phone vendor who I won't name, um, who our director of facilities and operations and IT was able to have them donate phones to us mm -hmm. so that we were able to distribute them to folks who that we already knew just in general had difficulty accessing or we had, I, I guess it's, it's more, it's more true that we had difficulty getting to them. I'm not sure that they were having trouble getting to us, but when we <laughs> wanted to talk to them, we, it was hard. And so as we've been able to reach folks over these many months, we've been able to give out these phones. But again, we're talking about a time when if you don't have that access already and you're being told to stay inside and you're managing a whole lot of other things, even though we have that tool, we can't get it to you. You know, we, we're not in the position where we can just like kind of go out and just hand them to you, hand them to folks that, that potentially put staff at risk. So even having this stuff doesn't necessarily change the, the lack of access. Um, but I think for those folks that we've been able to get them for, it, it's hopefully been useful. It came along with free service for a period of time as well. So that, that whole barrier was taken away for a period of time. That's amazing. I know at um, in the family medicine department, they were the recipient of a grant and don't ask me through who to get um, access to some tablets that have been distributed to kind of high need patients. We have a home visit program in geriatrics. And so we've gotten um, tablets out to the home visit patients so we can kind of keep tabs on them. But these are kind of one off programs. And it would be amazing if we had some kind of centralized thing to have right. access to patients to, um, we have a question from Bill. And I think the, as far as the voice assistance, I know that some of the EMRs, the um, electronic medical records um, have certain um, technology in them that allows us to use kind of voice control, but we're not that savvy, unfortunately, <laughs> as, far as, as far as I know, I don't know if I'm, I'm missing something. No. Um, and then Keith, you had a question about the vaccine. And that's this is a, a question we have no idea of the, if it's a one or done shot or if we'll need a yearly booster shot like the flu vaccine. We have no idea yet. I think that, that the issue of how long the vaccine is going to last is, is going to be going to take some time to get that, that answer. Um, and then here's a good one for the panel. Clyde asks us, is there any information as to how these vaccines will impact individuals who are HIV positive? I don't know if anybody's seen anything on that yet. I don't think, um, I don't think we know either. Mm -hmm. What we did know from fairly early on um, was that folks who were undetectable, so who were well controlled, the, the initial view was that they were not at any greater risk for COVID infection um, on the, than somebody who doesn't have HIV, but certainly someone with like, with any chronic disease that's uncontrolled, that they probably, there's more concern. And, and a flip or an additional sort of tangential piece of information is that the other thing that got shut down with COVID was, um, was community-based testing for HIV. And so the long-term impact of that is also an unknown consequence of COVID because people have been getting HIV in this period of time when we have not been able to test and screen and make sure that PrEP was in place in a, in a way. And this is, this is not an age specific thing. Everybody has sex and this is an issue for the whole age range. 
Thank you for that. So thinking about kind of what lessons we've learned so far from the pandemic and kind of thinking about delivery of healthcare services to vulnerable older adult populations, are there any lessons you've learned, Dr. Trice, in this, in this kind of past, what is it, eight, nine months now that you've learned about um, kind of getting care to vulnerable patients? Um, I, I think, to be honest with you, I, I don't know that, I, I don't know that we learned anything new. <laughs> I, 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 I think that we've, I think COVID has highlighted what we already knew, but we maybe seem to get, have gotten com complacent with or just taken it as, you know, this is just, it is what it is. We've taken that kind of attitude to, um, to, to health disparities uh, and, and, and really the social determinants of, of health. And when I mean we, I mean, as, as a society, I think that, um, you know, the, 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 the big thing, um, and, and maybe this is in some ways um, a, a good thing is that COVID, there's no one that COVID has not hit. Everyone has been impacted by COVID in some way, shape or form, whether it's not it's you know someone who's been diagnosed by it, whether or not it's you know someone who has um, unfortunately lost their life to, to COVID or whether or not you have been economically impacted by COVID because you, um, you know, you've lost your job or you've been fur furloughed or, or whatever the case may be, or, you know, uh, so everyone has been impacted by COVID. Um, and so I think it's allowed us to take a pause <laughs> uh, in some ways or forced us to, to take a pause and really see, hopefully see, see what's, what's, what's going on. I think there are communities that have, you know, this is not really anything necessarily new um, be, because there are certain communities, um, vulnerable communities that have been um, already been impacted by, um, you know, already have been impacted by having lack of lack of care, lack of health care, lack of access to care, chronic disease management, all of these things. Um, so um, hopefully what we have what we have learned by it is that we need to do a better job of taking care of one another, understanding okay. that um, if, if, if we uh, you know can can appreciate that, um, in some ways, I feel like we are a brother's keeper and we have to look out for each other as a, as a society um, and understand the, the, the health and economic impact that, it, that this has had on um, even more so on certain communities. Um, because it has hit everyone, I think we can probably have a greater appreciation for, 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 for that in the long run. Um, uh, I think hopefully uh, perhaps what we have learned is uh, that the mental, the mental health because of the social isolation that has come from COVID-19 that we need to do a better job of paying attention and placing resources um, within the, the mental health um, care field. Uh, it was already under-resourced. It was already something that was not getting the attention that it deserved, but again, COVID just kind of unroofed things. It was almost like you, we, we took off a scab. Um, and so hopefully, you know, because, be, because of COVID, we can start to give things, um, the air, these areas, the attention that, that, that they so critically need, so. Well said, well said. Anna, what do you think about in this next surge of COVID, what things do we need to be focused on as far as health healthcare services for our, our kind of commu our communities? Uh, well, I think we're going to see more um, influence in the area of telehealth, as Dr. Brisbane said, well, we're gonna see more demand for it. Um, where particularly uh, my focus is with long-term supports is not so much the physical health piece, uh, but the other piece is housing, housing, um, access to utilities, um, the communities that have limited access. Uh, for example, uh, we 
we're about to put a resource center in Chester. Chester just closed down their entire community there. Um, their city council closed down offices because of the increase in the COVID cases uh, last week. Um, uh, that's a community with food desert issues, um, a lot of disparities there. And we have to look at how we get information and access to people. How do we get more transportation to individuals who need to get to the doctor or need to get to the grocery store? Um, I, that's where our focus is. Our focus is, um, is really on bridging those gaps and getting every single person that that's aligned with our health plan what they need in order to stay healthy so if that's ppe if it's healthy food um, we have to work with them to get it and so uh, where we're focused going into this next wave is are you safe do you have utilities do you have heat uh, we're going to hit winter, which we really haven't felt with COVID yet. Um, so we're, we're going to be dealing with a whole new series of challenges we didn't have in April and May uh, that we'll feel in, in December and January. Um, we're going to see a higher, higher spike. We're already seeing that than what we've ever experienced since this began. Uh, we're going to see more people sick. And we're starting to say, uh, to have people ask us, do you have more PPE? How do we get it? The cost of PPE is crazy for something that uh, should be pretty easy to access and it's very limited. And when you do try to get it, it's, it's so expensive um, and that's just devastating. So we're, we're gonna just do whatever we can to keep people healthy and get them the, the other side of healthcare, which is, are you, are you, are you in a good place to live? Do you have heat? Do you have food? Um, do you have access to any other other things you need? So that's that's where we're at. Cost of PPE has been startling. I, I also work part time for a, a local hospice agency that takes care of a lot of patients at home and making sure that our nurses who go out in the community have the right PPE. It's been unbelievable to me that it's been such a challenge to get it and what it costs it's, it's unbelievable. Yeah, we address, John, we address that. Um, uh, one of my, one of my hobbies to bring down stress is to sew. So PA Health and Wellness created a little sewing brigade and we created, uh, we sewed over 1100 cloth masks yeah. and distributed them to uh, centers for independent living and uh, local charities that support our membership. Um, so it, that was a really good initiative and we sewed all through the summer. So we've got, we've been delivering masks since this began so that people can just wash them and, and have a mask and not have to spend $20 to get a mask. It's crazy. It shouldn't even be allowed, but that's just me. Soapbox moment. I'm with, I'm with you on that. Dr. Brisbane, what things do you think we need to be focused on going into this latest surge? So I'd say it's resiliency um, and creativity. I think that um, what all of this time has shown us is how incredibly creative we can be. We can learn new things and pivot and figure out how to do it well, even in the midst of not having it as ideally as we need it to be or would want it to be. So um, I think that both from a systemic perspective and individually, um, it's about tapping into that and going with it. And I, I'd say, especially for LGBTQ elders, um, what I've seen in some of my patients really is this resiliency. So it's, it takes on a couple of components. It's like a self, a, a fantastic self-awareness. This is what I need. This is what I'm not good at. Um, and, and being able to really focus in on that and problem solving and being a self-advocate and asking questions and figuring out what's happening with my insurance or where are the resources, what can I organize to help those people that, I, that I'm in touch with and my support. Um, and then engaging with community and, and with activities and efforts like the Elder Initiative and SAGE and William Way, like continuing to sort of bolster each other up and be supportive, um, certainly, folks who've lived to 75 or 80 years old didn't get there by mistake. They've accumulated a great deal of wisdom and coping mechanisms and to be, and many of them have 
have seen the HIV epidemic and lived through that, lost people understand what that means and can figure out for themselves whether or not this is a really triggering event and very upsetting, or if it again kind of sparks these coping mechanisms, resilience, support. And I think that those are the things that we can really focus on um, together moving forward is how we continue to do that. We There's so little that we can control. We can't control um, when the vaccine's coming. We can't control really whether we get sick or not. Um, we can do all that we can and figuring out ways to be able to manage that is I think what will keep us healthier overall. Great, really well said. Um, let's take a few more questions from the audience. Um, I see that Terry asked a question about testing access and she commented that she knows that Jefferson is offering robust COVID testing. Um, I have not heard about Mazzoni's testing, A, and I'm wondering how PA Health and Wellness is supporting access to testing. So do you guys want to tackle this for each of your organizations? I'll start. Um, we've been testing since May 8th. I believe it was a Friday. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we test for our own patients. So anybody who's a Mazzoni patient can call us up. And we started because it wasn't, at that point, it was more difficult to get a test when it was being required by an employer, as an example, to go back to work. Um, certainly for folks who felt hesitant to engage with the healthcare system elsewhere or other providers because of their uh, identity or general presentation. Um, so we've been testing all along. We test, for, we test three days a week. Uh, and if anyone who's a patient is welcome to call up, you don't, you don't really need a reason. Just if you just feel like you need to be tested, because I think the epi is important. You know that you don't actually have to have symptoms all the time. You need to know where it is in order to be effective at controlling. Anna, how about you? Is there anything that PA Health and Wellness is doing to help get testing done? Um, we, we work with our FQHCs on some testing, um, and have test kits with the FQHCs. Um, and after that, we just, we've been paying for thousands of them. <laughs> I, can, I can tell you that much. Uh, but moreover, that's, that's pretty much what we were doing with testings, working with our FQHC partners. Great. I've also seen that at Jefferson, they've expanded the testing to all of their hospital sites. So from my understanding is now all of the hospital sites within the Jefferson network um, have testing capabilities, which has been, um, I think a huge relief. Whenever I, I have people texting me and calling me all the time, how do I get a test? I'm like, call this number. And it's like easy to get it done. I don't have to worry about it. So that's been a nice help. It's been changing though, hasn't it? I feel like it's a constant, every few days I have to be like, what's happening now if I haven't checked? Wild. Yeah, 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 yeah. Jefferson has within the actual um, health system at the at the the various hospitals within the health system have um, made access to testing um, basically much more accessible, um, and many of the tests are 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 done on site, to, which makes it also nice in terms of getting the result back within a short period of time. I know that the timing of getting your result, um, uh, uh, even at a lot of commercial sites, that that was in some ways a disaster um, because you know you had to wait days um, even up to as close to, uh, up, even in some circumstances up to, to a week before you get your result back well in the in the interim if you're not quarantining you know you could you could re-expose yourself um, so it's been nice to be able to have uh, have access, but also to get the the result back in a timely fashion. And then with the um, a component of of Jefferson, the the Philadelphia Health, um, the Collaborative for Health Equity PJ um, was able to offer no cost COVID testing um, out in the community. Um, I think the the first site uh, was out in Northwest Philadelphia at at a local church, St. Raymond's, and so. Um, that was big, um, that, that was big, uh, you know, again, like we've been talking about a lot of times people for, for whatever reason um, did not access to care within the, the normal channels. So to be able to bring um, access to the patient where, where they are is, is, is huge. 
And that kind of speaks to another question that we had gotten from the audience, this, uh, this question of accessing in the community and then the question of cost. So one, one, of, one of the um, questions we had gotten prior to the webinar was, does Medicaid cover the same costs as private insurance if someone is hospitalized due to COVID? Anybody wants to comment on that? As far as I know, um, if you've been hospitalized with, with an illness, um, that coverage is taken care of. And I think that there have been some, some adjustments to uh, insurers providing temporary coverage so that you could get tested. And then certainly if it was positive, the ensuing care. Um, so I, I, yeah, I, I think that, that if you actually have insurance, go for it. You know, and if you don't, then access the, the resources to, to be able to get insurance. My understanding was through the CARES Act, all um, hospitalizations or services related to COVID was, was covered under that. So hospitals and health centers, et cetera, who are offering those services are able to get paid. So I was concerned that that, that question was kind of bringing up, if you have Medicaid, will, will somebody not get the same access to healthcare? And, um, what I've seen at, at, at you know, in, in the Philadelphia area is healthcare is offered wherever you can get it. So I, I would not be worried about the type of insurance you have as, as it kind of pertains to COVID. Um, one of the other questions from the chat was, have you been using CARES Act money to provide digital equipment? Um, I don't know if anybody has any thoughts on that. Uh, for PA Health and Wellness, the um, technology that we provided did not come from CARES Act funding. We, we, we just, same with our PPE uh, distribution, it was just funds that were allocated for the community. Great. Just looking through some of these questions that we have a lot of good questions coming in here. Um, all right, this is a question from Bill. Um, in reference to COVID and morbidity, are your facilities documenting deaths and placing sexual orientation, gender identity information on death certificates? I find this critical as we look at older transgender persons and long-term survivors of HIV AIDS. If this has been something, anything you guys have been seeing? I have, I don't know. Uh, it's a great question. I, I, I don't know if Jefferson is is doing that. That doesn't mean that they're they're not. I'm just not, right. I'm not a not aware. Fortunately, we fortunately we haven't um, lost very many patients uh, across this year. Um, the death certificate, if if I'm recalling correctly, actually doesn't call for this kind of demographic information. So it's not collected in that way. Um, and then, and then the, the causes that we write down, certainly if somebody died from, from COVID right now, we would write that, but I'm not, as I try to picture the last death certificate I filled up in my head, I don't think it captures, I don't yeah. think it asks, so no. Yeah, in my experience working for hospice, um, I haven't seen, we don't typically put um, gender, sexual orientation or anything like that on the death certificate, we simply put the time of somebody's death and then the um, principal cause or any related causes to their um, passing. Um, so thank you for that. And kind of getting to the, um, let me see what other questions we have here. Oh, Clyde is asking the $20 million question. How can we get individuals to wear masks to reduce the spread of COVID? I see lots of people that aren't wearing masks at all. Anybody have ideas on this one, guys? Because <laughs> It's a good one. <laughs> I don't know. I might say start with your circle. You know, um, the folks that you feel comfortable talking to. Um, some people feel comfortable talking to strangers on the street. Hey, put your mask on. I don't I think that kind of depends on who you are. <laughs> but even if you just talk more with the people that you are close to and, you know, use some of the messaging that that you probably know already, the, the mask is protecting both of us. This is the best that we have right now. Yes, the cloth mask is effective. Um, it's about the distancing and the mask wearing. This is a 
you know, there are also many reasons why you don't want to get sick, that, that kind of thing, I think, is a starting point. And at work as well, like, and when I say your circle, not just the people you live with, not just your friends, but if you work or if you're in school, like the places that you see people that you feel like you are, you are in community with them. So it's a, it's a reasonable request. Yeah, I agree a thousand percent. Uh, one of the questions that we had gotten was if the health system becomes overwhelmed, do you have a strategy to prioritize who gets treatment? That's a, that's a tough one. You know, I know that um, at Jefferson, there were many conversations and, you know, I think it's important to say, like, we, we talked about this as our worst case scenario. We never once had to do this kind of resource allocation. We, we had the conversations about what that would look like. Um, thankfully, um, many of the health systems in the Philadelphia area and certainly across the country have really ramped up um, their ventilator capabilities and their um, kind of access to personnel, PPE, staff, et cetera. So I'm very confident that we're not going to get into that situation. I think the way that we prevent getting into that situation is we continue to socially distance, wear masks, protect yourselves so we can keep the numbers down. Um, it's a scary thought to even go there, but um, it's certainly something we have to, we have to talk about. Um, I think we definitely have time for a couple more questions. Kind of pivoting a little bit from some of those things. We got a question um, earlier, which really has some concerns about racial and economic differences in how or when people are discharged from the hospital and are people of color more likely to be discharged too soon from the hospital? Uh, so, so that, so that's a tough question. I think I, what I would want, what I would say is no. I, I mean, I, I see why one would, would ask that question. Um, and this kind of goes back to that earned distrust that, um, you know, certain community, uh, you know, our communities have, um, with, with the healthcare system. Um, and it also gets to the question that the previous question that, that was asked John about, you know, rationing of care. Um, I, I would hope that we don't ever get to that point, but I know hospitals um, do, you know, they, they at one point were having that discussion because they were, there was fear that we were going to get there, um, you know, come as of May, um, you know, a, a around that time. Uh, and a lot of the, the decisions around that are, are very similar to like to, to, to someone asked a question earlier about risk scores, not the same thing, but how they get to you know, the, the calculations that are made around rationing of care usually deal with um, underlying chronic conditions, di you know, what diagnosis someone has um, and what is their likelihood of, you know, survival based off of these uh, underlying conditions if they were to, to, to um, have, have COVID. Um, so, but I think, but at the, at, at baseline, at just in, in general terms, absolutely not. No one, a person of color is not going to be discharged early just because of, of who, of who they, they are. Um, there are some unique challenges as we were discussing, um, you know, over the last uh, hour uh, plus, you know, that uh, communities of color, as well as, you know, the, the LGBT community and then the intersection uh, within those two communities, um, there are some clear challenges there that could pose, you know, some very controversial and tough situations if you were to get to a point of, of having to make these very tough decisions of, of, of rationing care. I think that's a great point. I think when the pandemic first started back in March, I think there was this, um, ageism that I was seeing and I think that we're getting to be much more conscious of and that um, oh well that person was 90 and they died from COVID like as if that person's life didn't matter. Um, I, I was so startled by that and I think what we've seen is it's hard to know who's going to get very sick you know in, in taking care of patients in the ICU in the hospital I've had 90 year olds who get up and walk out after a day of being in the hospital and I have 40 year olds who get seriously ill and end up dying. 
Um, so it's so hard to predict. And so I think um, a lot of the way the conversations were being held earlier during this, I think were very different from how they are now. I think um, we've been able to give people more of a shot, if you will, and not just simply write them off because of their age. Um, that's been a huge lesson. I think a lot of us are starting to acknowledge. Um, all right, and then one other question that we had gotten was, has COVID changed the ways you talked about patients about end of life care, such as DNRs and ventilator use? And is there hospice care for people with COVID? I don't know if uh, Nancy or Anna wanna to speak to that. I, I certainly can, but I don't wanna, I don't wanna steal your time. So I can just throw in that um, I have found myself talking about uh, end of life care and advanced directives more. Um, and when I say it to younger folks, <laughs> they get a little more freaked by it than I think older folks. And I'm like, you know, I know you probably think this is a conversation that we preserve for, you know, once you pass a certain age, yeah. but given what's happening right now and the fact that anyone can become ill and go into a hospital and no one can come with you, this needs to be clear for everyone. Um, but I do try to make it the a conversation that I have in all of those routine visits. Like this is a physical, we're not talking about your um, hypertension today. We're trying to be more broad uh, and talk about it with everyone. But I have had the conversation more, or I've thought to have it more probably uh, in, these, in these past months. Yeah, you know, it's one of those things, especially in the long term care settings that we've been looking at is how do we get how do we increase the uptake of advanced care planning, especially for patients in those in those settings who are probably at higher risk of being closer to the end of life. Um, and so I think that's something that we've been seeing. Um, you know, I, I think when this thing first started, we were having different conversations about ventilators than we are now. And just because somebody goes on a ventilator doesn't mean that they're gonna necessarily die. Um, they might just need a little time to recover. And so our, our way we've looked at this has very much shifted um, to kind of doc, you know, to Dr. Brisbane's point, I think that um, as a geriatrician, I've been definitely talking to my patients more about making sure we have this on record, thinking about different initiatives we can do um, in the hospital or in the, in the outpatient setting rather to get these advanced directives done. I have several residents I'm working with now who are reaching out to our home visit patients to really work on getting these things documented. These are our most vulnerable patients. And you know, when these things happen, these things happen quickly and we don't necessarily have a lot of time to have these discussions. And so I think it's, um, it's been a very, uh, it's been a very, it's, it's a positive thing that we're having these discussions because we should have been having them all along but there's just so many things that take priority. Um, and there is hospice care for people with COVID. Um, one of the things that's been really um, interesting when I have patients who leave the hospital to go home on hospice or my patients in the community who go on hospice, many times they would utilize inpatient hospice facilities or go to nursing homes with hospice. One of the things that I've seen, I don't have any statistics or anything, but anecdotally, um, many patients have and families have opted to move their family members home rather than put them in a facility, which would have been necessary, you know, at some point would have been the more preferred thing just because they can have professionals with them 24 seven. But the idea of not being able to be with your family is, um, or your, your chosen family, loved ones, whomever, friends, family, um, has become a really um, significant thing. And so these facilities will tell you that a lot of their um, admissions are down. Uh, but that just means that a lot of families are um, rising to the occasion to really help care for um, each other. Um, so definitely more, more home hospice, if that's to answer that question. Um, I think that's pretty much all the questions. One, one last question, and I think this is a good probably um, last question to really wrap up our discussion. How are folks on the panel dealing with the stress of COVID and how do you decompress and do your own self-care? <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, 
this is this is Tracy Trice. Uh, please forgive me. I had to switch devices. I am now on my on my cell phone. Um, but I think this is very apropos for this question um, because I am currently, I think both professionally and personally, um, this has impacted, uh, COVID has impacted me. I'm currently doing the COVID shuffle right now, trying to go and pick up my, 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 my children. Um, Superwoman. What, what's that? <laughs> Superwoman. Yeah. So, you know, just, you know, at any given time, you know, my kids are in school, they're out of school, and then having to try to manage, um, you know, manage that and find, you know, so 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 that their lives aren't completely uprooted um, by, by COVID and they're still getting what, what they need. Um, and then just, you know, speaking to the to the to the professional side of things, you know, I it, it's it's hard to see people who you've grown with, um, you know, patients that have, you know, grown up with me, you know, starting out, you know, when I first started as a physician or as a resident, and now, you know, seven years later, I've, I've grown with these patients and, and then seeing how they, they and their families are being impacted by this, um, lost work, lost wages, um, you know, dealing, you know, how are they able to, to afford medications and you know all of these things it's been it's been difficult it's been frustrating it's been angering at times but um it also you know those are the things that kind of give you fire to to kind of keep doing you know keep doing the work and the work and driving the conversation uh so yeah i mean in so many ways uh it, it, it's 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 impacted it's been impactful um but we can get through it i th i think the only way we're going to be able to get through it is if like like dr brisbane alluded to earlier is understanding that we are a resilient people and that we can uh if if we support one another if we if we hold one another up if we meet needs where the, where the needs are um i think that that we'll be able to to, to get through this um, together, so. Well said. Well, John, my panel, my panelists, uh, fellow panelists have captured most of it. They didn't mention the COVID-19 that you put on to, to manage the, the current environment. My, my uh, sweet tooth has been a little stronger in the last eight months. So I call it my COVID-19, um, but, uh, but I think, um, like Dr. Trice said, this has caused us to have to take a minute and uh, reflect. I think that's where if COVID's done anything for me to get through it, it's reflecting on what's most important to me and family, friends, people that you really want to spend your time with, you check in on them. Uh, I think that's most important, checking in on your people, even if it's a text to say, how you doing? And I'm thinking about you, uh, you matter to me. Um, I think that's, that's probably been the most impactful and then having something to do. If you're someone who's a go, go, go person and you're not going very much right now, um, you know, having, having, take that time and read, have a hobby, do things that, that, uh, keep your mind off of the stress of something you can't control. Um, strong women have a hard time with not controlling everything. Um, so it's, it's tough. So you have to find things you can do, uh, like hobbies, baking, uh, whatever it is, talking to friends. And so personally, that's how I've gotten through it. And it's made a world of difference having the people who love me in my life and check on me. So just reach out to somebody you really care about today, everybody who's on the call and just let them know you're thinking about them. I'll tell you, I got, when this thing first started, just having somebody shoot a text and say, Hey, checking in on you. I know you're probably really stressed. You're in the hospital doing whatever. It does mean it, it goes a long way. And uh, so I think taking time to kind of be kind to one another is such a easy thing to do, right? And it, it means a lot. So I would say that um, I'm a put my head down and keep going kind of person. So I'm not sure that I am managing the stress all that well. Um, I, so I manage it by continuing to work which is, and I enjoy working. So there's that. Um, I make my wife crazy. 
I'm sure, by what I don't do for myself. So I have good family support to try to steer me in a direction of taking better care of myself. And I, I really, really appreciate every single time one of my patients like holds me on the phone saying, be careful. Are you being careful? I need you to be careful. Um, and I was like, yes, yes, I'm fine. But it's, it's, it's so lovely to feel so cared for because they're not talking, they're, well, they're talking to their doctor, but they're talking to me. And that's been really wonderful as well. That's great. Um, I noticed that Terry put another question there. I think we have a couple of minutes before we have to wrap up. And Terry asks, um, um, do the panelists have any comments about how sexual orientation, gender identity data collection is being done, especially in regards to Department of Health directives? I don't know if anybody has any comments on that. I haven't done this much in my work. I thought there was some early work um, months ago about making sure that the data was being collected in that way from the city and the state perspective, um, but I've lost track and I don't know uh, if they are sort of back in the beginning when we weren't getting a lot of racial data either, um, they started adding in more, but I'm not sure. John, from my perspective, I'm not exactly positive all of the data points that we're collecting, um, but I, I'll check into it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you know, it's been such a um, changing landscape. Um, so I want to, you know, certainly thank everybody for taking the time to, to come in and, and um, hear from our panel. Our panel, thank you guys so much. I know you guys are extremely busy people and we appreciate your contributions to Philadelphia, to our patients, our clients, to everybody. So it really means a hell of a lot. So thank you. I also want to, to thank today's sponsors for our, our program, PA Health and Wellness, as well as the Philly AIDS Thrift. Um, I also want to invite folks um, to come to our two remaining um, Elder Initiative 10-year anniversary speaker series program, um, Aging and Access to Care on Thursday, December 3rd, and LGBT Aging Advocacy on Tuesday, December 15th. For more information, please check out our website, lgbtelderinitiative.org. They're putting that all in the chat right now, so if you guys want to click and sign up for those, knock yourselves out. Um, thank you guys so much for logging in. Stay safe, wear a mask, socially distant, all the things, all right? <laughs> thank you, everybody. Thank you. Good day. Bye.